Meeting of the Senate Judiciary Committee will come to order. We have a few items on today's agenda. Two judicial nominees, Mustafa Kushubai, U.S. District Judge for the District of Oregon, Yumi Lee, U.S. District Judge for the Northern District of California. In addition, at the request of the minority, minority, we will hold over my request for authorization for subpoenas relating to the committee's investigation into the Supreme Court's ethics crisis. While we will not vote on this item until next week, I want to make a brief comment. I am not requesting this authorization lightly. Over the past several months, story after story has emerged about lavish gifts and luxury trips that Supreme Court justices have accepted and failed to disclose. For many months, the committee has sought the voluntary cooperation of individuals and organizations who were re reportedly involved in these incidents. Several have cooperated with the committee's investigation, but Leonard Leo and Robin Arkley have outright stonewalled us. They have brazenly claimed that this committee has, does not have the jurisdiction, constitutional and jurisdictional authority to conduct oversight. Harlan Crow initially claimed he was willing to engage with the committee, but he ultimately refused to negotiate beyond a limited offer that was completely insufficient. To take just one example, Mr. Crow's offer would cover only the last five years when he has reportedly been extending these gifts to one Supreme Court justice for 25 years. My subpoena authorization for documents from these three individuals, <coughs> excuse me, who have refused to cooperate with the committee stands in stark contrast to the last time this committee authorized subpoenas. In that case, Republicans voted for a blanket authorization to subpoena more than 50 named persons and an unlimited number of unnamed persons when there had been no prior outreach to the vast majority of these individuals and the Justice Department was voluntarily providing responsive information to the committee. Unlike that unprecedented authorization, in this case, the Judiciary Committee is only pursuing compulsory process with respect to individuals who are refusing to comply with a legitimate oversight inquiry when the committee has exhausted its other options. For those who might claim this is about my disagreement with the court's jurisprudence, I can produce the letter that I sent 11 years ago, co-signed by several members of the committee, to Chief Justice Roberts and a much different Supreme Court, when Senators Whitehouse, Blumenthal, and I, along with other committee members, first wrote to the chief about the need for an enforceable code for Supreme Court justices. To those who argue that this is capitalizing on the moment, this was 11 years ago when we raised the same questions before the Chief Justice. The Chief Justice refused that opportunity, continues to do so now. However, this committee cannot sit by idly and ignore our constitutional duty to conduct oversight over the judiciary when the American people's confidence in the Supreme Court has reached record lows. The highest court in the land cannot have the lowest standard of ethics in the government. Likewise, this committee cannot allow Mr. Leo, Mr. Arkley, and Mr. Crow's baseless arguments to thwart our constitutional authority and the Senate's institutional prerogatives. They are not bit players in this crisis, and the information they hold is critical to understanding how individuals and groups with business before the court gain private access to the justices. This committee is lawfully entitled to the information we requested, and that's why I've asked the committee to authorize subpoenas with respect to this investigation. I now turn over to the floor to Ranking Member Graham. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Well, um, here we go. <laughs> you better eat breakfast next Thursday because you're not going anywhere until we have a... Number one, have you not noticed the world is on fire? You're spending more time trying to fix the Supreme Court than you are the border. Your policies across the board are not working. I've tried to work with you to the point I um, probably to my own detriment. The underlying approach you're taking, all of us believe is unconstitutional. You're trying to manage the Supreme Court. I wouldn't let y'all manage anything. You're trying to create a political issue that I think crosses constitutional boundaries. They're cases on the books that legislative subpoenas have to have a valid purpose. So we'll have a bunch of subpoenas to answer your subpoena. And we'll talk about stuff and ignore the elephant in the room for this committee. The border is broken. 
What are you going to do about it? The mayor of New York said today, if you come to New York, you can stay for 30 days. We're not going to pay for you to stay here free forever. The mayor of Chicago is coming to the White House today to beg for money to deal with migrants that have been shipped to Chicago from people in Texas and other places who are full. And we're going to be talking about subpoenaing three private citizens and get into the Supreme Court's business. You have lost your way. It's been a fairly productive session, I think, given everybody else around us. I voted for judges I wouldn't have picked. We're doing great stuff, I think, on social media. But I don't know why you did this. You know none of us are going to agree to this. You know you're not going to get 60 votes to enforce the subpoena. Mr. Crow offered you five years, and I don't know why he offered you anything. I told you go pound sand. So this is a choice you made. I try to be reasonable, but I can be firm. So from here on out, this committee is going to operate differently starting next Thursday. It's going to be harder, not easier. This is a fight you want. You're going to get it. Mr. Chairman. Senator Grassley. Uh, could I have a... I'd like to take two or three minutes on this subject. Uh, <clears throat> this effort to subpoena private individuals isn't what you call real oversight. It's part of this whirlwind of your party to effort to undermine the Supreme Court. It's part of a campaign by the left to harass and intimidate the Supreme Court because they don't like some of the recent decisions. Over the last six months, we've seen relentless effort by Democrats to cast doubt on this fundamental independent branch of government. Unfortunately, this request for subpoena authorization is just more of the same. The left's one-sided attack against our judicial system appears to be more about settling scores and ensuring integrity of the court. It's important to reiterate a couple of key facts that the other side is quick to ignore. The important thing is the Judicial Conference only recently changed disclosure rules in March. We ought to wait a while to see how that works out. The Judicial Conference oversees only the lower courts, and the Supreme Court justices generally follow these rules as well. In fact, all of the justices submitted uh, what we refer to as a statement, or they refer to it as a statement on ethics, principles and practices. They did this in April in response to the chairman's letter, which reiterates, the, quote, the, the foundational ethics principles and practices to which they subscribe, end of quote. The process in place appears to be working. The judiciary is pleasing itself. They already reviewed and tightened their disclosure requirements and we'll all know over the next year or so whether these efforts are enough. Again, this isn't real oversight. This is all part of the left's political master plan to delegitimize the Supreme Court and impugn certain justices. I look forward to discussing this issue in a longer way next week. End of I yield. Senator Whitehouse. Um, let me say two things. First. We have a supplemental that's being worked on right now where there's a bipartisan conversation going on to improve border security. That's a very appropriate thing to happen, and I hope we can continue to make progress on border security immediately in the supplemental and then in the longer term uh, under the jurisdiction of this committee where both you, Ranking Member Graham, and our chairman have a long, long history of interest and good work in that area. As to the subpoenas, let us be very clear about what is going on here. Billionaires who are invested heavily in influencing the Supreme Court have been caught giving enormous secret gifts to individual justices. This raises obvious issues about disclosure of gifts to justices, and of recusal by justices where the gifts 
should trigger recusal. On disclosure and on recusal, the rule for justices about disclosure and the rule for justices about recusal are both statutes, laws passed by Congress. The implementation of the disclosure and recusal laws passed by Congress is by the Judicial Conference, an agency created by Congress. So saying Congress can't investigate here is saying that Congress can't investigate how laws Congress passed are being implemented by an agency Congress created. That is obvious nonsense. Surrounding that obvious nonsense has come a billionaire lawyer's fog machine of invective and misdirection. For all the wailing and gnashing of teeth by the billionaires, this is actually pretty simple. Congress can, of course, investigate how laws Congress passed are being implemented by an agency Congress created. For me, all the theatrical wailing and gnashing of teeth from these billionaires and their lawyers signals actually that there's a lot being covered up here. And that should reinforce our determination to get to the bottom of this scandal. The fundamental question here is how bad, how corrupting, is the billionaire influence at the Supreme Court? How serious is the appearance of impropriety? You don't solve an appearance of impropriety problem by keeping the impropriety secret. It's still there. It is now time for sunlight, the best disinfectant. At the end of the day, the overheated objections we have heard from the billionaires assume the answer that nothing untoward or improper has transpired. But that is precisely the question we need to be investigating. To say that an investigation is outrageous and should stop because we're all innocent presumes innocence, a fact not here in evidence. Indeed, all of the abundant evidence is to the contrary, that this is part of an orchestrated scheme to influence and control our Supreme Court. Thank you, Chairman. Senator Cotton. First off, I want to agree with Senator Graham. This is partly a pretext to try to conceal the utter failures of Joe Biden and the Democratic Party. I mean, because all of you voted for $3 trillion of spending that this country didn't need and that our government can't afford, we have record high inflation. People can't afford their groceries. They can't afford gas. They can't pay the rent. They can't make car payments. The young men and women we have sitting behind us can barely walk to their apartments on Capitol Hill at night without worried about being mugged or drive there without fear of being carjacked because of your insane criminal justice policies. Our border is totally open. Each year under Joe Biden has seen more illegal border crossings than the last, setting record after record after record. These are not all poor, struggling migrant workers from Guatemala coming here for a better life. Thousands of people from China and Russia. Even the administration has acknowledged over 100 Uzbeks came here with the help of an ISIS-associated facilitator in Turkey. And their position is, honestly, maybe it's just a coincidence that these Uzbeks used a travel agent associated with ISIS. And that's to say nothing about what's happened around the world. The collapse of Afghanistan in 2021. Russia's invasion of Ukraine in 2022 the worst massacre of Jews since the Holocaust in 2023, all under Joe Biden's watch. I know the Democrats on this committee like to claim that the former president unleashed chaos in the world. None of that happened on Donald Trump's watch. Maybe he 
offended your European friends for using the wrong fork, tea and crumpets at some point, but there's peace and stability when he was president. So part of this is just a pretext to cover up for your own utter failings and competence of the Biden administration. But it's more than just that. It's not, as Senator Whitehouse says, an effort to expose wrongdoing at the Supreme Court. It's an effort to delegitimize the Supreme Court because you don't like the way they rule. When you lose at the ballot box for years, you tried to achieve in courts what you couldn't achieve through democratic elections and legislatures. You thought the Supreme Court was your own special province. And then, when there became a center-right majority on the Supreme Court, you began to attack its very foundations. This is not some secret. It's wide out and open. Chuck Schumer has gone to the steps of the Supreme Court and threatened justices by name that they wouldn't know what hit them if they ruled in ways that the Democratic Party didn't like. In May of 2022, the unprecedented action of leaking the Supreme Court decision in the Dobbs case occurred, unleashing left-wing street militias outside of justices' homes. Justice Alito, the author of that opinion, says that he thinks he knows who it was, and he thinks it was done on purpose to assassinate a Supreme Court justice to stop the Dobbs decision from coming down. Merrick Garland did nothing to stop these left-wing street militias as they blatantly violated federal law protesting outside the homes of justices about a pending matter. In fact, he directed the Marshal Service to make no arrests. He lied about it to Congress, exposed by Senator Britt from Alabama. It all culminated where it naturally was with a left-wing hitman traveling from California to the Capitol region and being caught outside Brett Kavanaugh's home with things like zip ties, tactical knives, pepper spray, hammers, screwdrivers, nail punches, crowbars, duct tape, pistol lights, boots padded for stealthiness, and a Glock 17 pistol. Even after that left-wing hitman was caught outside Justice Kavanaugh's home, the White House continued to refuse to enforce the law, indeed, to celebrate these left-wing street militias. The White House spokeswoman even said, we certainly do continue to encourage that, the protests, outside judges' home. That's the president's position. That's what this entire episode is about. Not about getting to the bottom of behavior that's permitted by law and permitted by rule, but continuing your brazen and outrageous campaign against the Supreme Court because you don't like the way it rules. You all ought to be ashamed of yourself because you're the ones who always profess how you're defending our democracy. You're the ones undermining our democracy. As Senator Graham said, things are going to be different here starting next Thursday. But not just that, she will be on the other foot one day. Go ahead, issue this subpoena. See what happens when we take back the majority. See which one, see which subpoenas we start to issue for the left-wing activists and billionaires who are behind all of your agitprop campaigns, who probably help fund those left-wing street militias outside justices' homes, who help fund the anti-Semitic wing of the Democratic Party protesting on college campuses and even in this Capitol complex. Go ahead, issue your subpoena next week. We'll see what happens when we take back the majority. <clears throat> Many of us have traveled down interstate highways and been amazed to see RVs of the superstars cruising back and forth to county fairs and events. It's a huge undertaking with a vehicle of substantial size. One of our Supreme Court justices 
was given one of those vehicles valued at $250,000 and asked to pay back the loan for that purpose. He made one payment and declared it and then stopped. We've since learned that he received that vehicle as a gift, a gift, a quarter of a million dollar gift. Should that have been reported? If you were a member of Congress, you wouldn't think twice about it. Of course it has to be reported. That's one of the responsibilities of public service. For us to raise questions, basic ethical questions about the conduct of justices and the court is fundamental, as Senator Whitehouse has said, to our constitutional responsibility. For us to suggest three subpoenas pales in comparison to the other side's request for 50 or more subpoenas on the operation, I forget the name, Crossfire or something. Hurricane. Hurricane Crossfire. I mean, they've used it and didn't think twice about it. To argue that you're going to blow up the committee over our exercise of use of a subpoena, which has been exercised by the other side when they were in the majority, just doesn't track as far as I'm concerned. Uh, Mr. Chairman? Certainly. Senator Graham. I'm going to yield to Senator Kennedy just in a second. What you said about that transaction, I don't think is accurate. <clears throat> but we'll have all day Thursday to talk about it. I'll yield to you just a second, Senator Kennedy. Uh, demand justice. Remember, I don't know who they are. They're under the Arabella umbrella. I don't know if it's George. I don't know who gives them all this money. But every time I turn on the TV, they were trashing out Michelle Childs who I was going to support for the Supreme Court. I don't know who funds demand justice. I don't know if it's a billionaire, a millionaire. I don't know if it's a, a bunch of poor people who got, want to give their money. I, I imagine it's somebody from the left with a lot of money wanting to make sure she didn't make it on the court. And Senator Cotton's dead right. I mean, you're trying to destroy Clarence Thomas like every time we turn around. And uh, this court is made up of people that, our center right. The days of having the court to do your bidding uh, are over. They're going to rule, I think, in ways more consistent with what the court should be doing, and on occasion I disagree with them. The bottom line here, <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, you've <clears throat> decided for some reason to push us for subpoenas on a Concept we think is unconstitutional. Whether we're right or not, we think that. It's not going to go anywhere. You're not going to get 60 votes to enforce this subpoena if you pass it on a party line vote like you did the underlying bill. So this is a choice you've made. And I am perplexed, given everything going on, why you chose to do this. But you have. To the detriment of this committee, to the detriment of the country, I think, because we're going to be talking about stuff <clears throat> rather than doing stuff. And I would like, to, if we could, to work on things that need to be dealt with, like out of control social media, a broken border. Senator White is right. We're going to give you a proposal. This is what, uh, November of 2023? And we're just now getting around to having a serious discussion about securing the border. So I will yield to Senator Kennedy, but this is a very disappointing moment for me, and we'll see how it all plays out. Senator Kennedy. Um, Mr. Chairman, Senator Whitehouse. I, I, I just find this extraordinary. And I, I find the timing of this to be extraordinary. Um, I think most of us can agree that America is this big, wide, open, free, sometimes dysfunctional, often imperfect, but always good country. And we all love it. But we're going through a rough patch. Um, inflation is gutting our people like a fish. 
people in my state have to sell blood plasma in order to go to the grocery store. The border is wide open. And that's under the jurisdiction of this committee. Now, I know some folks think that if you oppose illegal immigration, you are, are necessarily a racist. That's not the way the American people look at it. The American people support legal immigration, but they look at the southern border like their front door. Most Americans lock their front door at night. Not because they hate everybody on the outside, but because they love the people on the inside. And they want to know who's going into and coming out of their home. And I don't think that's unreasonable. We don't talk about it much anymore, but since the Affordable Care Act was passed, insurance premiums in America have tripled. We're not doing anything about it. Um, we've always had people in America, unfortunately, who are too poor to be sick, but now many of those people are in the middle class because of our health care delivery system. We're going through a rough patch. Internationally, the world's on fire. The world's on fire in Eastern Europe. It's on fire in the Middle East. The embers are smoldering in the Indo-Pacific. You don't have to be Mensa material to see that this is all being coordinated between and among China and Russia and the Ayatollah in Iran. Their goal is to have Russia dominate Central and Eastern Europe, to have the Ayatollah in Iran dominate the Middle East, to have China dominate the Indo-Pacific and Sub-Sahara Africa and be free to make whatever move they want to in South America. Look at the democracies that are being overthrown in South America. And that is not a world that is safe for America. But what are we concentrating on? We have decided, Mr. Chairman, to attack another branch of our government. Now, Senator Whitehouse, I, I, I don't agree with you respectfully that the fundamental issue here is bribery at the Supreme Court. I don't believe that. And I don't believe you do either, sir. I think the fundamental issue here is that there's some people that don't like the opinions being issued by the United States Supreme Court. And that is your right. I've disagreed with many of the Supreme Court's opinions, but I haven't tried to destroy them. I think you're making a big mistake here, Mr. Chairman. I say that with all the respect I can muster. And, and, and he, he, here's my question. No one in the Milky Way With the, with, with the possible exception of one of Hunter's hookers, believes that all you're interested in is a few documents. Is your end game to subpoena Clarence Thomas and make him appear before the Judiciary Committee? Does the senator yield the floor? I was hoping I could a get rhetorical, our. I was I'm hoping, to I, was hoping I could get our chairman to, to to give me some of his. I'm thoughts. sorry, I didn't realize that was directed to me, but yes. I will respond. Our end game is to follow the facts. We cannot accumulate the facts without the cooperation of the witnesses. When the witnesses, after repeated attempts to appeal to them, have failed to produce these facts and documents, uh, we've turned to a subpoena. But I can tell you, it's after a long, arduous journey. Or have done everything we can to try to get their voluntary cooperation. Well, Mr. Chairman, do you believe we can subpoena Clarence Thomas? 
I haven't addressed that issue either privately well, we or have, publicly. and we say no. I'm going to go to the roll call votes and then continue this uh, discussion if the members wish to stay for that purpose. First is Judge Mustafa Kasubi, nominated to U.S. District Court for the District of Oregon. Does anyone seek recognition on the judge's nomination? I do. Uh, I, I think I voted almost 90 some percent of the time for district court judges uh, that were picked by senators working with the White House. I sort of like that. As a matter of fact, I just were, was able to work with the White House legal counsel to get a nominee from South Carolina up. I wouldn't have chosen any of these people, but I'm a little old fashioned. I'd like to have senators still have input about district court judges in their state. <clears throat> and when you're out of power in the White House, um, we're working as best we can over here to find acceptable nominees. And uh, I'm proud of what the committee's tried to do and, and to the members and the minority been, I think, very reasonable. Uh, these two are just way out of bounds. I mean, just like over the top out of bounds. I do not trust these two nominees to give me a fair trial because I think they're so indoctrinated in their liberal thoughts and their attitudes about life. It oozes from their pores. I mean, you could feel it, not just hear it. These people are really committed to their causes, of which I almost have don't share any of them. And it's okay to disagree with each other, but I don't believe they could resist the temptation to be a district court judge to advance their causes. And I've never said that before in this committee. But about these two, I believe that. So I'm voting no to both. So the question is unfavorably reported. Mr. Chairman. Senator Cruz. You asked if people wanted to be recognized on... Well, I agree entirely with Senator Graham. The judges that have been nominated by Joe Biden have been extraordinary. They have been extreme. They've been so egregious, they fill me with a sense I could not have previously imagined having, which is I long for Barack Obama. Because although I disagreed with many of President Obama's judicial nominees, they were comparatively moderate when put next to the radicals that the Biden White House keeps putting forward. You look at Judge Mustafa Kasubai, his questionnaire in history, and you would be forced to conclude that he is a radical leftist, if not an outright Marxist. Now, those are not my words. In one essay he wrote, Katsubai argued that the integration of Marxism with traditional economic theories of property, specifically that of Locke and Bentham, would, quote, provide a framework for relationships that enhance each unique self. Here's a pro tip. If a guy is writing love letters to Marxism, maybe he's not the best candidate to be a federal judge. Also in that same piece, he argued, quote, the aspiration towards intimate knowing, the intimate knowing of oneself and others in our community is a creative struggle towards redefining property. How many of y'all want to redefine property? And maybe the answer is all the members of the committee on the Democrat side do. Your constituents don't. Redefining property, being told, for example, the home, your family home that was your home and your mother's home and your grandmother's home is no longer your property. It is the state's to do with what they will. Redefining property is an objective of Marxist. Marxist, and by Marxist, I mean communist. Communism is not simply theoretical. My family has suffered at the hands of communists. And yet in the Biden administration, that appears to be a qualification for becoming a federal judge. 
Not only are his views extreme, but when it comes to gender and sex, they're really out there. In the Wisconsin Women's Law Journal, Judge Kasubai wrote a piece titled Destabilizing Power in Rape, Why Consent Theory in Rape Law is Turned on Its Head. He cited radical professor Catherine McKinnon, who argued, quote, sexuality itself is a power web in which heterosexual relations per se are infused with violence and control and that most intercourse is rape. Is it the position of the Democrats on this committee that, quote, heterosexual relations per se are infused with violence and control and most intercourse is rape? That's moonbeam nuts. And you all know that. But there's a reason every Democrat senator is looking down, because you can't defend these views to your constituents. You're counting on the fact that the corporate media will not tell your constituents about the loons you're voting to confirm. Katsubai also, in apparent agreement, quoted Professor McKinnon as saying, quote, I employ the view that rape is sex in order to focus on the significance of consent in rape law, and non-consent must be presumed. That's a lot of things, but that's not actually American criminal law. This guy has been nominated to be a real judge applying the real law. Katsubai tied these two together in the same article where he quoted, quoted approvingly from McKinnon the phrase, quote, sexuality is to feminism what work is to Marxism. Now, to be honest, I don't know what the hell that means, but I don't like it. It's out there. What is it that make you see this guy crowing about how wonderful Marxism is and you say, hot diggity damn, we found us a judge. We also know that it is his view, DEI, diversity, equity, and inclusion, will be central to his approach to the law. How do we know this? Well, because he said it. And here's his quote, DEI, diversity, equity, and inclusion, is the heart and soul of the court system. Can we say that? Yeah, I just did. And I'm saying it proudly. Well, DEI, the radical anti-racism school that embraces discrimination, says we should discriminate against people that are perceived to be oppressors in favor of people that are categorized as victims. God help you if you're some poor schlub white guy who ends up in court in front of this guy. Apparently, the heart and soul of his court is to discriminate against you because that's what he's embracing. He's also said that America is, quote, deeply Islamophobic. Well, we're the freest nation on the face of the earth. And somehow he couldn't seem to be bothered to worry about the rabid anti-Semitism that we're seeing at radical schools across this country as the same kind of left, leftists like Judge Katsubai are announcing their allegiance to Hamas and terrorizing Jewish students. Katsubai's rulings on the bench are also extreme. Think back to the 2020 Black Lives Matter and Antifa riots all across the country. Major American cities burned for weeks, for months on end. Police cars were firebombed. Police officers were murdered. Stores were looted. People were assaulted. In Portland, Oregon, this was the federal courthouse. Does that bring warm tinglys about the fair enforcement of law? Portland, Oregon, the courthouse, the federal courthouse was subjected to a 60 day siege, two months. Rioters firebombed the building. They fought federal agents. They used high powered lasers to blind federal agents. 60 days, 
night after night after night, a federal court on fire. Well, what's Judge Katsubai's view on this? He wasn't in Portland, Oregon. He was in Eugene, Oregon. As Eugene, like the rest of the country, was facing risks from this riots, Eugene imposed a temporary curfew to try to impose law and order. What did Judge Katsubai do? Number one, he wrote an opinion recommending the curfew be struck down. Nope, you can't have a curfew. The night belongs to the rioters, to the people burning courthouses, not the people who'd like to be safe in their own homes. He went further than that. He actually denied qualified immunity to the city manager and the police chief and said, you know what, Mr. Police Chief? Because you imposed a curfew, because you tried to protect people's safety, you can be sued. In effect, he said, sue them for trying to keep the people safe and take their last penny. I understand a Democrat administration and a Democrat Senate is going to confirm liberal judges. That should not be news. What is astonishing is not, not a single Senate Democrat on this committee has been willing to demonstrate even one iota of independence in exercising advice and consent. When Donald Trump was president, he nominated a lot of judges. Y'all didn't like the Trump judges. You voted against pretty much all of them. I will tell you, I voted for most of them. But Republicans on this side, there were several ju judicial nominees that we said, no, this doesn't meet the standards, pull it down. And the Trump White House did. That's actually how the constitutional system is supposed to work. For whatever reason, Democrats on this committee don't believe in that. No matter what nutcase gets nominated, like the Politburo, you all vote da. Yesterday, we had a judicial nominee who three years ago signed an open memo to the governor of Connecticut calling on him to empty the prisons and release every violent criminal in Connecticut, release murderers and serial rapists and child molesters. Now, that's not your run-of-the-mill lefty. That position is nuts. I don't care how left-wing your state is. California, Vermont, Georgia... New Jersey, you can go to any of your states, grab your citizens and say, hey, what do you think? Good idea. We go down to the prison, let everyone go. Nobody's going to like that. Your citizens that you're elected to represent will say, what the heck is wrong with you? This judge is a radical, is extreme. If he's confirmed, we can count on him to let violent criminals out of jail. And I'll tell you, if Senate Democrats continue to rubber stamp whatever radical this White House sends them, people are going to die. When you release murderers from jail, they turn around and they commit more murders. And when that happens, the work of this committee rubber stamping, putting extreme radicals on the bench will have been directly responsible, and I hope you're prepared to look in the eyes of the victims' families of the people that will pay the consequences of putting on the bench men and women that are manifestly unsuited to being judges. Mr. Chairman. Senator Kennedy. Mr. Chairman, I'm not going to repeat what my colleague Senator Cruz said about uh, Judge Kasabai, but... Uh, He's not qualified to be on the federal bench. And, and, and everybody on this, in, in this hearing today knows that. You heard the same testimony I heard. He's entitled to his beliefs. Look, about 90% about of my personal philosophy is don't, don't hurt somebody unless you have to defend yourself. Don't steal other people's stuff. And leave me alone. If, if you want to use different pronouns, that is your business. I may not ag agree. I may not do it. But that's your business. This is America. And you're free to do that. But this judge used his authority 
to require litigants in his courtroom to do what he thinks is politically correct. And he did that as a magistrate judge. And he'll do it as a federal district judge, and you know it. Once again, I don't care what his political beliefs are, but he has no right as a sitting judge to direct in writing litigants in his courtroom to stand up and introduce themselves by saying, my name is John Kennedy. My preferred pronouns are. Now, the judge said in his testimony that was voluntary. That's not true. I've read the order. What, and, and he said, but it's voluntary. It's voluntary. Right. I'm a litigant in his courtroom paying a lawyer $400 an hour to try to get my case resolved. And the man on the bench who's going to decide my case tells me to stand up and announce my pronoun. That's not voluntary. That's oppressive. And that alone, forget his writings, which Senator Cruz went through very eloquently, that alone tells me that he cannot exercise power maturely. If I could vote no twice, I would. And on this final point, when President Trump nominated people that weren't qualified to be on the federal bench, we killed those nominations. And several people on your side of the aisle, my Democratic colleagues, and on our side of the aisle did it. By my count, we killed five of them. Dead as fried chicken. And we didn't do it behind closed doors. We did it here in the committee. We demonstrated they weren't qualified. Now, here's your chance. This man is not qualified to exercise power as a federal judge. It's bad enough that he's a magistrate. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Judge Kosobai has responded to the questions that have been raised on this topic, and I'd like to read his response. Let me stay unequivocally, as I did during my hearing. I am not and never have been a Marxist. I have never espoused nor subscribed to Marxist theories. Rather, I've been an active participant in and beneficiary of the American capitalist system, as is clear from my own holdings of private property and securities, as detailed in the statement of net worth provided to this committee. And there's more, if you wish to read it. Let me also notice that he, note that he has served for 16 years on the state and federal bench and as a neutral appellate decision maker for four years on the Oregon Workers' Compensation Board. He has an ample record of service as a judge, and his philosophy is demonstrated in any rulings that he has uh, handed down. So in defense of uh, Judge Kosoba, I think some of the charges that are being made are wildly unsubstantiated. At Mr. Point, Chairman, uh, may I be heard for just 30 more seconds? I've been very generous to you. I know you have. Would they, you be generous one more time? I will. Go ahead. Thank you. Thank you. I, 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 I appreciate the judge's response. But we all heard his testimony, and we all, all have read his record. And sometimes people don't tell the truth in their responses. I'm not calling the man a liar. I'm just saying, who are you going to believe? His written responses, probably crafted by the White House lawyers, or his testimony in committee? And we're, I think what we're going to see going forward is more of this, these types of exchanges going on here today. Uh, when somebody's qualified to be on the federal bench, by God, I will stand up. I don't care what party they are. I was the lone Democrat Republican vote to confirm a nominee from Tennessee. I'm almost done, Mr. Chairman. Almost The lone seconds. Republican vote. But from now on, if we're going to play it like this, we're going to have a debate on all of these nominees and talk about their testimony in committee and, 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 and who was forthcoming and who wasn't. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You've been very kind, and I appreciate the extra time. You're welcome. Unfortunately, one of our members has had to go to the floor, and it, we don't know when he's going to return, and I can't ask the committee to sit and wait 
We'll reconsider these two nominations next week. The committee stands adjourned.